And then the last one I'll give you before I read this last verse is when I was 17 years old. I was uh, at a concert, played guitar, right, even then, and there was two people playing in a small theater. One was Les Paul, the guy that made the guitars, who was a legend, and the other was George Benson, who was also a, a, a legend. But it was only a 100-seat theater where we were. They weren't that well-known, and that would have been 74 or 5. So you're all doing the math of how old I am. <laughs> so um, we tried to sneak in the back door and ask Les Paul if I could go in as his son so I wouldn't have to pay for the ticket. And he laughed. He thought that was really creative, but he said no. And so we had to pay. And uh, as they did their set, and they were about to take a break, and before they walk off, this, that was a stage. This is not. George Benson just felt like telling a story. And he said, when I was 19 years old, which would have been, I don't know, at least 10 years before that, where we were, he said, I was playing uh, a jazz concert with Miles Davis and John Coltrane. And he was the guitar player at 19 on the stage with those guys. And that, the way jazz works is it's very improvisational. There's just a structure of chords, but then each player gets to take a solo and everybody in the audience is sophisticated enough to know when that solo ends they'll, they'll give you a hand and then when so Miles Davis goes everybody claps John Coltrane goes everybody claps and now it's George Benson's turn right so you'd be a little nervous wouldn't you after those two guys so he goes third and now the audience claps louder for George Benson than the other two that's pretty cool right so they go for their break and John Coltrane who became a Christian before he died, after a really rough life, he looked at George Benson and said, hey, kid, that was really good. Don't ever do it again. <laughs> now, I know why most of you are laughing right now, because you think John Coltrane somehow felt stood up. Not the case. See, like, we just assume that. Jazz is improvisational. You never play the same thing twice the same way. It's part of the art, is that you won't do that. And it's so Holy Spirit, right? Because the, if this exact same group of people showed up next week, it still wouldn't be the same group of people, because we'd be a week older. Right? And things would have happened during that week. We're the same bodies, but like this is how much God cares. And he was saying, don't sell out your soul. And I'm sorry if you're in a wedding band, but that could kind of be how it feels like, why am Like, I don't want to be that guy. You know, like you're playing the same song the same way every week. And if I burn that picture in as, as a religious Christian, good. Because, you know, like you don't accomplish anything if you don't take a risk. And we just get so worried about our reputation. And what if this and what if that? And what if I don't do it wrong? Well, what if you don't say anything? Then the living water was right below the surface. But nothing broke through because you have to take that initiative to break through. Speak to the rock. Don't strike the rock. Oh, thank you. Talk to Danny Hall sometime about the challenge of working with me. <laughs> so grateful for his patience. So this says, our ancestors were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, right? This is 1 Corinthians, so Paul's talking to a group of pretty carnal Christians, right? There weren't a lot of Jewish people in Corinth, but the believers were, were, were sincere, but they were operating out of their flesh a lot. There's a lot in, in 1 and 2 Corinthians about the gifts of the Spirit and trying to help them understand that. So he's like, our ancestors were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through a sea on dry ground, in the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses, which, you know, there's other ways you could say that. But the point is, they made it out the other side. Now, we're coming up on Passover, right? That's the first of the three big feasts that Jesus told us to celebrate, that the Word of God tells us about. It represents deliverance coming out of Egypt. How many of you were in Egypt? I'm not talking about the real country now, just in case you're wondering. No, right? You were in sin. You were slave to sin. And any Egyptians here, please don't be offended if we're going to use that uh, politically correct angle. We're not talking about real Egyptians. We're talking about what it represented, slavery, for hundreds of years. 
And boy, this is a big celebration because nothing else could get them out but miracles. And it was the blood on the door. Like, oh boy, pretty clear picture there, huh? So they came out, they walked through the sea on dry ground and the cloud in the sea and all of them were baptized as followers and all of them ate the same spiritual food. That would have been the manna, right? And all of them drank the same spiritual water for they all drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. Can you picture that now today? We're still traveling with the spiritual rock because he says right there that rock is Christ. And Christ has allowed you to become a partaker of the divine nature. But you have to throttle your anger. And, you know, some of us have to need a bigger throttle than others for that anger. And that's okay. Look, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we'd like to just say, well, no, that's just not how I'm wired. That's not my temperament. Look, like I said, you're coming out the other side resurrected. You need a new passport picture because you're not the same person. You're alive in God. Speak to the dry bones and tell them to live. That's how all of us are. Come on, let's stand up and, and let's just seek the Lord about actually trying to apply this in our everyday life. That's the hardest part about all of this. We're so easily just going to the computer simulator or we're playing YMCA the same way for the 500th time. It's like, no, Lord, I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be a religious, st structured person where, where that becomes the law, the letter that kills but I also don't want to be the fruitcake person out here who's just not tethered to any reality of the word, right? Because there's extremes on both sides. And, you know, the charismatic Pentecostal movement has had plenty of black eyes from people that got caught up in the excess of the Holy Spirit peace. But look, we're, we have to live now here today in this region. And there's a lot of intellect and a lot of wealth and, you know, all people on all different parts of the spectrum Every one of them is special to God. The Bible says he doesn't want one person to perish. Not one. So think of the person you want to perish right now. Right. If you're angry at somebody, it's like, well, it wouldn't be a bad idea. No, that's not sowing and reaping, right? Let's just, let's just dig in and say, Lord, it doesn't matter what I'm seeing in the natural. I know you could change anybody. Yeah. Like you have this amazing ability to be present to every moment in my life. So let's just lift our hand and ask the Lord. Just say, Holy Spirit, come in in a fresh way. I need you to enable me to look past the person's image and see what you see and speak to their heart, not to the package. Lord, your word says, when I open my mouth, you will fill it. Help me, Lord, not to strike the rock when you say to speak to the rock. All right, so I just want to give you your marching orders. So like Trisha said, the power of testimony is really strong. Let's try to live the week where we can come back next week and talk to people and say, man, I tried what he said. It worked. It was really cool. I didn't get the response I thought I was going to get because I took a little risk. And I, and, I, and I went out on a limb for Jesus. 